Welcome to part 8.1 of our George Bridgen study night. And tonight we're going to be going into more detail about the features of the face. And right now we're going to be talking about the eye. So let's get into it. Above the eye socket or orbit, the frontal bone is betressed and of double thickness. The cheekbones beneath are reinforced and the entire bony structure surrounding the eye is designed to protect the most vulnerable and expressive feature of the face. The eye, cushioned in fat, rests in the socket. In shape, the eyeball is somewhat round. Its exposed portion consists of pupil, iris, cornea, and the white of the eye. Due to the transparent covering, or cornea, which fits over the iris, much as a watch crystal fits over a watch, making a part of a smaller sphere laid over a larger one, the eye is slightly projected in front. It is the upper lid that moves. Its curtain, when closed, is drawn smoothly over the eye. When open, its lower part follows the curve of the eyeball, like the roll top of a desk, folding it beneath the upper part and leaving a wrinkle to mark the fold. The transparent cornea of the eye, raised perceptibly and always partially covered by the upper lid, makes this lid bulge. This bulge on the lid travels with the eyeball as it moves, whether open or closed. The lower lid is quite stable. It may be wrinkled and slightly lifted inward, bulging below the inner end of the lid. The lashes which fringe the upper and lower lids from their outer margin shade the eye and serve as delicate feelers to protect it, the upper lid indistinctively closing when they are touched. The nose. The nose is the center of the front plane of the face. Its shape is lit. Its shape is wedge-like, its root in the forehead and its base at the center of the upper lip. As it descends from the forehead, it becomes larger in width and bulk, and at its base, it is held up in the middle and braced from the sides by cartilages. The bony part of the nose descends only halfway from its root and is composed of two nasal bones. The lower part is composed of cartilages, five in all two upper, two lower laterals, and one dividing the nasal cavities. Two wedges meet on the nose, a little above the center at a point called the bridge of the nose. The direction of one is toward the base of the forehead between the eyes, that of the other toward the end of the nose, diminishing in width as it enters the bulbous portion at the tip. An upright wedge is seen as a narrow cartilage at the upper margin of the car. An upright wedge is seen as a narrow cartilage at the upper margin of the curtain of the upper lip, where it divides the navel cavity to two parts. The outer wall of the cavities are called wings. They are more angular than round and are known as the buttresses of the nose. So we're back on schedule and I thank everyone for watching this. Finally get a little breather to talk to you guys about how much it means to me that you're watching these, how much it means to me that we're learning together as a group, as, as artists, reuniting and, and just loving to draw, loving to share, loving to grow with each other. And here I'm doing a, a molding. Uh, if you look at back at the molding videos I did in the molding section that George demonstrates, that is a prime example of molding and you can see the nose that's sticking out. Now I'm going to go ahead and and develop the nose and then George was saying that there's like six parts to the nose two what two sides two in the front and then two in the middle and here I'm doing like a rhythm exercise with the nose if you remember go back into the rhythm section of our of our study nights that that was a rhythm and here I'm just kind of going in with some some shadow mass I'm doing some nose exercises and just just flowing with it what, looking at George's work and just flowing with it. Thank you. 
That part of the jaws in which the teeth are set is cylindrical in shape and controls the shape of the mouth. If the cylinder is flat in front, the lips will be thin and the mouth a slit. The greater the curve of the cylinder, the fuller and more bow shaped will be the mouth and lips. From the base of the nose to the upper lip, this cutaneous portion of the mouth has a central vertical groove and pillars on either side which bend into broad, tripping wings ending. In fleshy eminences called the pillars of the mouth. The upper lip has a central wedge shaped body indented at the top of the wedge by the groove above and two long slender wings disappearing under the pillars of the mouth. The lower red lip has a central groove with a lateral lobe on either side. It has three surfaces, the largest depressed in the middle at the groove, a smaller one on either side diminishing in thickness, curving around, a smaller one on either side diminishing in thickness, curving outward, and not so long as those of the upper red lip. Below the lower red lip, the cutaneous portion of the mouth slopes inward and ends at the cleft in the chin. It has a small linear central ridge and two large lateral lobes bounded by the pillars of the mouth.
the ear. The ear, irregular in form, is placed on the side of the head. The line of the ear towards the face is on line with the upper angle of the lower jaw. The ear in man has lost practically all movement. It is shaped like half a bowl with a rim turned out, and below is appended a piece of fatty tissue called a lobe. Its muscles, which in primitive times, no doubt, could move it to catch faint sounds, now serve widely only to draw it into wrinkles, which, thoroughly varying widely, have certain definitive forms. There is an outer rim often bearing the remains of a tip, an inner elevation in front of which is the hollow of the ear with the canal's opening protected in front by a flap and behind and below by smaller flaps. The ear has three planes divided by lines radiating from the canal, up and back and down and back. The first, lines, the first line marks a depressed angle between its planes. The second marks a raised angle. The neck. The neck is cylindrical in shape, following the curve of the spinal column. Even when the head is thrown back, the neck curves slightly forward. In front, it is rooted at the chest and canopied above the chin. In back, it is somewhat flattened and the back of the head overhangs it. The neck is buttressed on each side of the shoulders. From behind each ear, a muscle descends inward to the root of the neck. These muscles almost meet each other, making a point at the pit. They form, in fact, on the front plane of the neck, the sides of an inverted triangle whose base is the canopy of the chin. The two muscles referred to are called bonnet strings. Into this triangle are three prominent forms, a box-shaped cartilage called the larynx or voice box, just below it a ring of cartilage called the chrysoid cartilage, and beneath these a gland called the thyroid gland. In men, the voice box or larynx is larger. In women, the thyroid gland is more prominent. The whole is known as the Adam's apple. The neck has the following action, up and down, from side to side, and rotary.